you know, we're all on Zoom now and Zoom, uh, I don't know what their market value is. I think it's over $100 billion. It's a like, ginormous number. Somebody, somebody will correct me, I'm sure. But it's interesting, the guy who founded uh, Zoom uh, was working for WebEx, uh, which had been acquired some years ago by Cisco. Right. And, and the guy was so keen to, he, he knew WebEx was not very well suited for the cloud and not very well suited for mobile device. He was like so keen to, to build something that exploited these new trends. And, and he couldn't get anybody at Cisco to say yes, right? Fighting up through all the levels and trying to get the budget approvals. And the guy left and built Zoom. How would you feel if you had the right to design your own job? Your team was free to set its own goals and define its own methods. You were encouraged to grow your skills and take on new challenges. Your workmates felt more like family than colleagues. You never felt encumbered by pointless rules and red tape. You felt trusted in every situation to use your best judgment. You were accountable to your colleagues rather than a boss. You didn't have to waste time sucking up or playing political games. You had the chance to help shape the strategy and direction of your organization. Your influence and compensation depended on your abilities and not your rank. How amazing would it be if all these things were true where you work? Welcome to an Innovation Channel podcast here on Total Picture. I'm your host, Peter Clayton. And I'm really looking forward to today's podcast with Gary Hamill. I met Gary a couple of years ago in Las Vegas at Unleash, where he was a keynote speaker. I'll put a link to that interview in the show notes. Gary is on the faculty of the London Business School and is a co-founder of Management Lab, an organization that builds technology and tools to support breakthrough management innovation. Professor Hamill has been hailed by the Wall Street Journal as the world's most influential business thinker, and his landmark books have been translated into more than 25 languages. His latest book, Humanocracy, Creating Organizations as Amazing as the People Inside Them, was published this year by Harvard Business Review Press. The utopian wish list I started my intro with came from the preface of Humanocracy. Gary, thank you very much for taking time to connect with me here on Zoom. So let's start with the obvious. Has COVID-19 altered your thinking? If you were sitting down to write Humanocracy today, what would you change, if anything? You know, it's certainly uh, altered our lives a lot. It's It's been the most extraordinary test of individual and institutional resilience that I think one could possibly imagine. Uh, however, it's certainly not the only test, right? We are at a unique point in history where we're confronting some I think really profound uh, challenges around uh, climate change, uh, income inequality, uh, mass economic migration, the job displacing effects of AI. And of course, it's also a world that's filled with opportunity made possible by 5G and synthetic biology and a lot of new technology. But if you look at just uh, COVID, Peter, I guess here would be my take. Um, certainly what you've seen here is many organizations under pressure have had to uh, uh, let people at the, at, the, at the fringes kind of do new things. You know, in a, in, a, in a small crisis, power tends to move to the center, but in a big crisis like COVID, power moves to the periphery. You know, our, our organizations, you know, bureaucratic as they are, don't do very well with things that are both novel and fast moving. And that's been the definition of this COVID crisis. So what we've seen is a lot of people at the fringes of our organizations out on the front lines have dusted off their initiative. Uh, they have uh, you know, formed networks, horizontal networks with others. They figured out what to do and we've learned kind of as, as we've gone. And the folks at the top and in the center have pretty much been on the back foot. That's true for our for big government agencies. It's true for most companies. So it's been a wonderful kind of testament to the capacity of ordinary people to adapt and adjust. Having said that, I don't think it's gonna change fundamentally the way our organizations work. Uh, certainly coming out of COVID, it's likely we'll have more people that continue to work from home. Uh, but then millions of people have been working from home already. I mean, many people work in call centers, for example. That happens in their home. They connect in, into their job uh, with, their, with their computer and so on. And, and the reality is a, a, a kind of crappy job done remotely is still a crappy job. Uh, you get to save yourself the commute, 
But working remotely doesn't give you a bigger influence over strategy. It doesn't make it easier to get a new idea funded. Uh, it doesn't uh, give you, you know, uh, an ability to fire a, 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 an abusive boss. So I think it's it's probably not going to change a lot. And what we've seen in past crises, and we we, we saw this um, after the financial crisis in, in 2008 and nine. In those crises, you'll see kind of a little downtick in, in, in bureaucracy. Companies will take out a level or two, or they may simplify a few things. But soon after the crisis, that growth, that the, the growth of the kind of the bureaucratic uh, uh, class is back on the same trend line. And we saw that before. So even though power may move out during the depths of a crisis, people at the center tend to be quite jealous of their prerogatives and will often pull that power back quite quickly once they have the opportunity to do so. So, you know, sadly, COVID has been, uh, you know, has 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 been fatal for for many tens of thousands of human beings. Uh, but unfortunately, it's 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 unlikely to prove fatal to bureaucracy. Yeah, that is too bad. You know, but I I think one of the the more interesting aspects of the pandemic, um, and and this gets to what you were just talking about has been the work from home imperative. You know, for years, most companies have insisted that employees must show up at the offices to be able to do their work in an efficient and productive way. Well, guess what? It turns out that uh, that's complete BS. Am I right? You know, I, th I think a lot of it is. Um, I know, and, and I think what, what you were just describing there, Peter, is, is leaders, so-called leaders, trying to maintain the illusion of control. So I might be in this chaotic, uh, hyperkinetic world, but as long as I can look out, I see all, quotes, my people, uh, and they're doing what they are supposed to be doing. Well, somehow, like, I, I'm, I'm in control. And of course, you're really not. Uh, and that uh, today, it's quite easy to assess somebody's work, whether they're working close to you or not. You know, the, the flip side of, a, of that is, is uh, working at home, uh, you know, doesn't doesn't necessarily make make you any less uh, micromanaged than when when you were working uh, physically. Uh, you know, today with technology, we have kind of a digital tailorism. We can see exactly what people are doing hour by hour and how productive they are. But but clearly, you know, I, I would say if if COVID doesn't fundamentally change our organizations, it's, it's at least going to probably give them a nudge in the right direction. Well, let's talk about that a little bit, Gary. What other bureaucratic rituals has the pandemic debunked in your mind? Not much, <laughs> I, I have to say. You know, when I'm on the phone and I've been on the phone as, and on calls, you know, a lot over the last few days with 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 some of the biggest organizations in the world, and they're they're you know they 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 don't see COVID as 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 being a a lever that's really going to help them change. It's something they have to endure. It's something they have to get to get through. But but interestingly, and I, and I have to say on a positive note, most of the CEOs I talk to around the world today, they will tell you and they understand that the real challenge for their organization is not an old operating model. It's not the supply chain or the back office. They also increasingly know it's not the business model, even though they're all busy trying to you know do the digital transformation of their business models. More and more CEOs will tell you, we understand our fundamental challenge is our management model. It's the way we lead, the way we organize and plan. We have too many layers. We're too slow. We're not entrepreneurial enough. You know, people spend too much of their time fighting political turf battles, and they know that needs to change. Unfortunately, many, very few of them uh, have a roadmap for doing it uh, and have had the courage to kind of declare all-out war on that old kind of bureaucratic model. But most of them know that that that, that this is going to have to change. There's something fundamental is going to have to change in this bureaucratic model that we inherited from the industrial age, uh, and is still is still the the standard operating system for virtually every organization on the planet. Really, yeah. So you know, talking about CEOs and, and quoting from Humanocracy again. At present, the average CEO compensation in America's 350 largest companies is 17.2 million a year or 278 times the pay of a typical frontline employee and and I think it's important to stress that this income disparity is unique here in the United States so what is the motivation for getting rid of bureaucracy if you're in the top 1% you know you 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 might, you might well ask um yeah. uh except you know I, I I think there is this growing recognition 
that that the other ninety nine percent are not very happy, and 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 you know, and and they have political power and they have influence. You know, it's quite interesting, Peter, watching what's happened in the last couple of political uh, 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 presidential elections here in the United States. Uh, in in two thousand sixteen, many many people voted for Donald Trump, who had been kind of. Uh, uh, the victims of, of globalization, of deindustrialization, they had seen their livelihoods uh, disappear, and they had this sense that kind of the ruling class was not watching out for them. Uh, in both that election and this one, you also had millions of young people, a lot of them stuck in gig economy jobs, who were so fed up. They said, you know, let's, you know, we, our preferred candidate would be Bernie Sanders. Let's throw our lot in with him, and maybe, maybe socialism will work. And then, of course, in the end, you have kind of a compromise, you know, somebody in the middle with, with Joe Biden. But there is a deep discontent out there. A, a survey run uh, this year uh, in the United States found that only about a quarter of Americans believe that capitalism right now works for the ordinary American. And that's, that's like an extraordinary uh, 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 indictment because, you know, there, there really isn't an alternative. Let's not pretend that there's some magical alternative to, to capitalism. There isn't. Now, in saying that, I, I wouldn't say for a moment that they're not things that we need to change about the way capitalism works. Um, you know, you, you could argue we need more incentives for long-term shareholding. You could argue we do need some controls on CEO pay, that companies need to need to uh, take more care with the environment, uh, put more attention to diversity. You could say all of that. But I think if you if you look at the real frustration people have with capitalism, it is, it is none of those things. What they see and what you were just intimating there, Peter, is they see that over the last decade or two or three, most of the rewards have gone to the CEO class and the investor class and very little to ordinary employees. That's right. And, you know, and so our argument there is, you know, the way, the way we, we see to solve that, Peter, and, and if you like to, to, to rehabilitate capitalism, is, is not primarily through big government programs or mandated transfers or more regulation. Yes, we probably have some tech companies that need to be cut down to size, but it's really, it's really changing the way we see people at, at the bottom of our organizations, and I and I use bottom uh, ironically and pejoratively because I don't think there's a bottom to any organization. We kind of look at the people at at you know kind of at the at the lower levels, but but what you find is people in in those jobs by and large across America. I'm, I'm see if I can get the data right. I think right now 44 percent of the U.S. workforce are in jobs that that we would describe as as low paid. And, and, and therefore probably low skill. So the, the terrible kind of assumption we make about those people is that if you are in a low paid job, it's because you are a low capability human being. Right. And if you look at that by credentials, that may be right. They may not have a university degree or professional qualifications, but what our research in, in kind of these post bureaucratic organizations we talk about in the book shows, that, that there is no such thing as a low skilled job. There's, there's no job on the planet that, that, that is inherently low skilled. What you see though, Peter, is a lot of low opportunity jobs where the people in those jobs have not been trained to think like business people. They have very little scope to experiment or, or try new things. There's no upside for them uh, uh, to do so. They exist under a blanket of, of rules. And so then when, when little imagination or creativity is forthcoming from those people, then we, then, then like we have this, this self-fulfilling prophecy, because then we say, well, you know, they're not very creative. They're not very capable. You know, I, I heard, and I won't, I won't quote the person because there's no reason to like drag somebody on the bus, but, but the managing partner, the former managing partner of one of the biggest consulting companies in the world was, was quoted this is the last couple of years in a piece that I think uh, he co-authored for a leading business magazine. This is what he said. I'll, I'll quote it with nine, I think about 90% accuracy. He said, the CEO, the CFO, and the CHRO will look into the future and plot the destiny of the corporation while everyone else has their heads buried in operations. Like what mind blowing arrogance, right? There's like just a few people that have the bandwidth, the creativity to look into the future, see what's coming, think about new customer needs, whatever. But, 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 you know, the average organization, Peter, is still a, a, a kind of caste system right. that, that, that differentiates between executives and employees between uh, kind of thinkers and doers. And yet when we look at companies like Nucor, the, the, the most profitable steel maker in the United States, when I look at um, uh, uh, Birdzarg, a leading home health provider in the Netherlands, uh, higher in China, what you see is organizations that have 
almost no managers at all. You see frontline employees who have the freedom to make big investment decisions, tens of thousands, sometimes more investment decisions to, to, to buy the tools, the equipment they need to do better. People have a financial upside in their own business. If, if they improve things, it ends up a big part of it in their pocketbook. And so you, 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 you see that it is possible to turn uh, employees into entrepreneurs. You don't have to join a startup. You don't have to be in a little company. In every company around the world, if we're willing to teach people to think like business people, give them a financial upside, give them some scope to experiment, you find that people bring their creativity to work. They take initiative. They do these things. The business becomes much better and their salary goes up. Their compensation goes up. So, yeah, I, I think for me, I think, you know, the biggest problem we have with capitalism is that we don't have enough capitalists. And, and that doesn't mean just giving an employee a few shares. It means it means creating businesses where everybody feels like I'm working for something that's mine, that where I have I have the, the upside and the autonomy that an entrepreneur would have. And we're seeing this d- being done in some very large, complex global companies. So we know we know this is possible. And, and we know that by doing it, you unleash an enormous uh, 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 wellspring of human, human capacity that right now is, is mostly tamped down. Yeah, I agree. And, you know, back to what you were uh, talking about with the gig economy, if you are an unskilled worker in the gig economy, you're basically getting screwed because, you know, you're working at Instacart or, you know, doing one of these very low paying jobs. And I think a lot of that is the failure of our government and, and, you know, companies and unions to not reskill all of these workers. I mean, we've known for years what AI was going, the impact AI was going to have on the market. We've known for years how, you know, machine learning and all of this new technology and and computer power was going to disintermediate a lot of the jobs that were in factories. And yet no one did anything to reskill the workers. Yeah. Right? Well, I, it's it's certainly true. It is certainly true, Peter. And I'll I'll try to avoid a rant here. But it is certainly true from my sorry from my perspective. It seems to be true. Let me be careful here. It seems to be true that for the most part, the the political and the corporate elite have very little concern or regard for so-called ordinary employees and ordinary citizens. That just seems to be a fact. And um, and that doesn't, you know, you don't have to become a protectionist or somebody else to say that. Now, what I guess where I might have a different view, though, is while I think there are certain things that governments can do to reskill and definitely we can improve numeracy and, and so on. And in, in, in secondary education, there's a lot of things we, we can do and we should do. It's, you know, it's it's tragic that the U.S. ranks, you know, way down the, you know, the, the rankings in terms of uh, uh, um, uh, numeracy and, and literacy uh, performance uh, uh, among 16-year-olds and 18-year-olds and so on. Having said that, I think the fundamental barrier is the way our, our organizations are run. Th- think about this. And, I'll, and, I'll, and, I'll, and I want to come back to Newcore in a minute because it's just it's this really heartening example of what's possible. You know, the average employee at work, e- even, even relatively poorly paid employees, you know, they, 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 they buy a car, maybe a used one, and they take a loan out but they make financial at, at work, that person cannot requisition a $300 office chair without somebody's permission, right? They, they have almost no autonomy and no freedom. So I think of, I think of Nucor, and, and we have a dozen examples like this in, in, in our book, but Nucor has consistently been the most profitable steel maker in the United States. They run about uh, 75 steel plants spread across uh, the U.S., um, they have, at, at, it's, 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 a, it's a more than a $20 billion company that has fewer than 100 people at the head office. They have about a third the number of managers for their scale that you'd find in a typical company that, that size. The managers there, the leaders at the top, they've told me to this. I said, Gary, here, being a, a manager is the least noble work you can do. All of the innovation comes from people on the front line. So you have so-called blue-collar employees, most without a university degree, who are running hundreds of, of thousands of experiments a year and how do you how do we get better at making steel, who are responsible for creating demand, who are out there talking to customers, what, what new can we do for you? 
all of those employees are paid. They, they have big bonus that depends on them raising the productivity of their plant. So they have every incentive. In fact, it's interesting, Peter, Nucor is the most highly automated steel maker in the United States. They embrace every new kind of automation because it improves the productivity of those human beings. And they, they get rewarded when they figure out how to do that. So I was, I was talking to their recently retired CEO, uh, John Ferriola. I said, John, you know, you must hire extraordinary people to get to that. People are this smart and they think like business people. He said, no, no. He said, Gary, we can do this with 99% of the people in any community. But when you, when you, when you, and they're organized into small teams, you feel like you're working for your own business, you get to capture a lot of that financial upside. So you find a company that pays way above the average in their industry, that has never had a layoff, that can compete with any company in the world on a level playing field. And, and yet, you know, without any government incentives, without any big program, they've simply said, we're going to build an organization where we treat everybody as a human being. And, and rather, rather than working to maximize compliance, we're going to work to maximize contribution. And, and I will tell you, if, if every company was run like Nucor, we would not be talking about deindustrialization. We wouldn't be talking about our, our communities getting hollowed out. But, but, but when, you, when you treat employees like semi-programmable robots, that's kind of what you get. And I would, I would argue that we should worry about AI and jobs to exactly the extent we continue to treat employees like robots. Because we have real robots now, right? We don't right. need, but, but, but that's what we've done. And so, you know, we know from all kinds of research looking at this, that human beings, as far as we can see into the future, they are going to have an advantage in creative problem solving and lateral thinking in, in social connections, They're, these are things machines are not going to figure out how to do within our lifetime. And yet, you know, in most organizations, the average employee has very little scope to do any of that, you know, and, and happily there are suggestions, you know, Toyota, uh, Toyota's employees generate about 2 million suggestions a year for improvement. Like what, when, what are robots going to start to analyze very complex manufacturing processes and say, hey, by the way, here's something you never thought about as a way of improving this. They won't. Uh, AI, they're very good at pattern recognition. As human beings, we're very good at pattern breaking. And we have that advantage. We're going to keep it. But in most organizations, the average employee has little chance to do any of that. Yeah, Nucor is, you know, is a fascinating story in your book. And you have many examples from all over the world, from China, from Sweden, from the Netherlands, like like you mentioned. And these are you know, these are not like uh, companies that are doing new innovative things. These are companies in healthcare and, you know, creating uh, appliances and, and, and the kinds of businesses that have been around for years and years and years that are really innovating and doing things in a completely different way. Yeah, I think, you know, the, the reality is... And making is money. And making, and making money. Yeah. On, our, on <laughs> average, they're far more profitable. They're far more productive than their peers. And, and you get, and maybe we come back to it, you get to a very interesting question. Like, well, if, there, if, 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 if that's possible, like why haven't more companies followed suit? That's a slightly different conversation. But, but let me say this, you know, the most, the most familiar ubiquitous social technology in the world is not Facebook. The most familiar social technology in the world is bureaucracy. Because basically, you know, there's an operating system that is the same in virtually every, and I don't care, it's private sector, public sector, large, medium-sized, Different countries, it doesn't matter. You go into any company and you see the same thing. You know, uh, uh, strategy gets set at the top. Uh, your your power correlates with your rank in the organization. Uh, human beings are competing for the scarce resource of promotion. Uh, and and that model is so familiar that we just assume that's the only way you can organize, you know, human beings. But it's not. And And yet, you know, it's the one we see and it's the one we teach. And so kind of the analogy I use sometimes, Peter, is this. There, there are many areas of our lives where over the last few years we've seen radical change. So if you think about how we consume media, right? I, I remember when I, when I moved to England uh, and I was living in England full time at the London Business School in Britain, uh, at that time there was three terrestrial television channels. And I remember the first Sunday afternoon I was in the UK, my choices of entertainment were to watch snooker, sheepdog trials, and darts. That was a little culture <laughs> shock, right? 
<laughs> came came to love it all, but not on the first Sunday. And now today you look at, you know, you look at Netflix, you look at YouTube and all of this. Like that's a that's a, a radical change in how we consume media. We we have radical change in and and how we make payments as we move to cashless society, radical change in how we move ourselves around with electric vehicles, autonomous vehicles. And yet, like we're still running that old management model. And 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 like every technology, it's a product of its time. If you go back, you know. To when when the idea of bureaucracy was a new idea, industrial bureaucracy, probably the you know the late uh, 18th century. Uh, at that time, the average employee was illiterate, not just poorly educated, but illiterate. They needed managers to tell them what to do. Uh, being a manager or an administrator was a new thing, right? That was that was a brand new skill that people needed to learn. And so we we set up business schools. We taught people how to be good managers. And it was you know in in the early late 19th, early 20th century. Being a manager, it was like being a data scientist or geneticist today. There's like rare magical thing because administrative skills were rare. Uh, it was it was a time when when information was very expensive to move. And, and the best way of doing that was to have 10 people report to a boss who would aggregate all of their information, report up, and they'd aggregate it again. And 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 in that kind of an organization, only the people at the top had, had the big picture. So only they could, could make smart decisions. Well, you look at today, none of those things are true. Employees are pretty well educated. Uh, information, we can move it very easily. Ad- administrative skill is, is just one skill among many, right? And, and yet our organizations still have layers and, 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 and uh, you know, and, 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 and we still, still treat human beings as if they're kind of stupid at work. So our, our, pa- you know, our plea in the book is that like, it's now time to like uninstall that old model. We, we just, we have to do better because frankly, we can't solve the problems we're facing as a species with organizations. I mean, let, let me give you some data to make this real. I, I apologize. I haven't thrown any data. So here's some, here's some hard data. Um, we know that only one in five employees at work believes their opinions matter or one in five. We know that only about one in eight uh, believe they can influence decisions that are important to their work. Only one in 11 says they have the freedom to experiment with new methods, tools, products, whatever. Uh, we know that in the U.S. economy, the, the U.S. Bureau of Labor Statistics says that 70% of all jobs require little or no originality. And, th- and that says nothing about the people in those jobs, but how those jobs were constructed. And you know, most damning of all from Gallup, we know that only 15% of employees around the world are truly engaged in their work. And, and when you dig into that, what you find, Peter, is the problem is not the work. 89% of people say, hey, what I'm doing is okay, but the problem is how they're managed, right? They're infantilized, right. They're, you know, they're treated, you know, and, and so uh, it's, it's not an exaggeration, I don't think, to argue that the typical organization wastes more human capacity than it uses. And like, that's just like, uh, apart from any utilitarian argument, like that's just wrong. You know, it's just wrong. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you know, I'm, I'm happy to quote some more statistics from your book. And this is a direct quote from your book. In, uh, in 2018, there were 146 million employees in the U.S. workforce, excluding the uh, farm and household workers of the self-employed. Of these, 20.5 million were managers and supervisors. In addition, there were 6.4 million individuals working in administrative support functions, including HR, finance, accounting, and compliance, but excluding IT. In total, then, the bureaucratic class comprised 26.9 million individuals, or 18.4% of the U.S. workforce. This group claimed more than $3.2 trillion in compensation, or nearly one-third of America's total wage bill. It seems to me that this has to change. Yeah, you know, I think so. If you, you know, it's quite, it's quite interesting, uh, Peter, um, writing, I think almost 30 years ago, Peter Drucker, the famous, you know, management right. uh, thinker theorist, Peter Drucker had predicted that by now our organizations would have uh, uh, half the number of layers and a third of the number of managers. And it just hasn't turned out that way because the, the data you're quoting there, uh, when you look at that over time, here's what you, what you see. Uh, between uh, 1983 and 2019, uh, the number of managers, administrators, supervisors in the U.S. economy grew by uh, almost uh, uh, 150%. All other categories of employment grew by less than 50%. 
So the bureaucratic class just keeps getting bigger and bigger and bigger. And, and some people have blamed that on, you know, more government regulation, therefore we need more bureaucrats and, and so on. But when we look at it and you pick that apart, it's, it's not that. The reason it's been growing is that bureaucracy itself is kind of self-propagating. So, so if you're in an organization where, where the way you earn more, the way you get ahead is you have a, you have a bigger headcount, you have more people report to you, you have a bigger budget, what happens? Right, people continue to grow their fiefdoms. In in most companies today, anytime you have a new problem, we set up, we get a new CXO. So you have your chief compliance officer, chief diversity officer, chief experience officer, chief innovation officer, chief transformation officer, chief technology officer, and they build their own little fiefdoms. So we have more reporting and, and more vice presidents and so on. And and so so you know the US is is basically you know, like like every economy, because it's not unique to the U.S., it's simply becoming more and more bureaucratic. And I don't think, Peter, I don't think it's by accident that that as as that as bureaucracy has been growing, uh, productivity growth has been has been declining. You know, it's, it's a fundamental challenge of our of our time. Over the last twenty years, year by year by year, our productivity growth comes down. And as long as that's true, we cannot. We cannot improve our standards of living. We have no hope of paying off all the debt we have. Income inequality gets bigger. Populism is, you know, is going to retain its 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 pull for many people. And so, you know, I think that we are not going to create a more dynamic, more resilient, and a more equitable society until we kind of move beyond that old that old that old model. And uh, the book basically lays out not only the argument for 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 why we need to but hopefully is a lot of a lot of help on like how do you actually do that when you work inside an organization that's still kind of run on that old model yeah you know one, one of the things that I was thinking about this morning uh, regarding your book and this interview it, you know you devoted an entire chapter to the power of community so you know what are some strategies for maintaining community when community today means zoom? <laughs> you know, and virtual conferences and hardly any human physical contact. Bumping elbows is not giving somebody a hug or a handshake, you know? Yeah. Wow. It's, it's absolutely <laughs> true. And I think that's why I think some of the predictions, I, I'm, I'm going to go out a limb a little bit. And I think, uh, I, I think we're going to have a lot of people who are actually quite eager to get back to work in a physical setting. Not, not every day of the week and not all the time. But, you know, we, we have a hunger for the face to face and, you know, that's, that's, that's just how we're wired. I don't think that's going to change. And, you know, and it's, it's sad Gallup, Gallup's data says that only two out of 10 people have a close friend at work. And, um, you know, and, and, and all of us are at our best when we're, when we're in, in something that feels like a community where we're known and we know others, where we feel trusted, where you can feel you can be yourself, you can take risks. And I would argue, and there's a lot of evidence in the book that, organizations that have that strong sense of community, you see it at Nucor, you see it at Southwest Airlines, they're just better at solving problems, right? They're just always, groups of people are always coming together and saying, like, I can't do this on my own, but let's get together, let's solve this, let's let's go forward together. And so in, in a more like technology intermediate world, like how do you build community? Well, I, I think a big part of it is just taking time. You know, unfortunately with the average Zoom call, you start, you end, people go off and you, you just got to build some space in there for something that feels more social. And it's also it's a set of habits. You know, one of the one of the most thoughtful things I heard on this was was from from this chap at, at Newcore, John Ferriola, and and he rose up through the ranks to become the company's CEO, and he describes uh, Newcore as a chain of trust, not a chain of command. And I asked him, I said, John, like, what did you do as you went through your career? What did you do to build that sense of community? And he said, this was my strategy for every single person I met, from when I was new hire all the way to being CEO. He said, the first meeting I had with anybody, my only, the only conversation was, who are you? Like, where do you come from? What are you hoping, you know, what do you want in your life? Not about their work, but what do you want in your life? Tell me about your family. You know, what, what, any struggles, things you want to share. But, but I, first I have to, I have to invest in them. He said, the second conversation would be about work, but it would be about what can I do for you? What's not working here? What can I do to help you? How do I make your job better? What can I get out of the way for you? And he said, only in the third conversation would I say anything about my expectations or here's our corporate challenges or you know, me, me, me kind of talking to them. And I think that made a huge impression on me because you know, community gets built through conversation 
and conversation that's not necessarily immediately goal directed in the moment. It's really about getting to know people. And, you know, unfortunately, I, I think many of us, we've, we've kind of been taught that, that, that you, 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 you don't bring all of your humanity to work, right? You come, you know, you're, you're a shield. You don't really talk about the struggles in your life. You don't talk about a, a child who's struggling with addiction or, a, a, you know, a, a divorce that you're going through or a parent who's has dementia. And, and yet, you know, I, I know that you, you cannot come and be effective at work if, if you have to leave all of that part of yourself somewhere else. You need people at work that, that, that you can share that with. And so companies like Southwest have been very intentional about how they support that, that kind of community. And I think it's a little harder to do virtually, but it's, it's mostly about just taking the time. Yeah. And I think that is so important, especially today. And, and, you know, I, I remember, you know, during the, the, the big, uh, financial crisis, 2008, 2009, uh, I was talking to someone who did a lot of, uh, of corporate meetings and people would not show up to these meetings because they were afraid to leave their desk because they were afraid that if they went to some offsite to get some information and knowledge that people would say, well, you know, so-and-so isn't here, so they must be expendable and they lose their jobs. And I, I think a lot of that mindset is going on right now. You know, yeah. people are terrified of losing their jobs. And so they, you know, they, they're even more lockstep. Well, you know, one of the things, it's, it's interesting bargain that some of these, I think, progressive companies have struck with their employees. Uh, and let me just stick with Newcor and Southwest. I could give you quite a few others. Basically, in those organizations, on average, uh, they often pay less than market rates. But their employees have a significant upside, and so and 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 they usually achieve that upside. I mean, on average, these employees are paid above industry average, but their base salary is often below. But what the their employers have said is, "You do your job well, you have your job, right?" And so these are companies that have never done large scale layoffs ever, even when they could have bumped the quarter, they could have been profitable for a year, they chose not to do it, and and they will tell you. For our shareholders, that's a much better long-term deal. We're buying loyalty. We're buying commitment uh, that, that manifests itself in people who care about the customer and care about their work and, and will go to the trouble to innovate and experiment and take risks. That's simply not going to happen if somebody feels expendable. So that, that, that you know, the, the, the fact that, that a majority of people at work today probably feel quite expendable, uh, you know, and that we've gotten there. Now, COVID, you know, we can't be accountable for that, right? There's certain realities there that I don't think, I'm not suggesting that every company can avoid. But but what you're describing is something that's pervasive. It's not just COVID related. But that kind of insecurity uh, at work, I think is, is fundamentally short-sighted. And, and, it's, and it's one of the many ways in which our organizations, as, as the British would say, are, are penny wise and pound foolish, right? We and, and, and part of that I would argue, Peter, is our accounting systems help us measure some things very well, but other things not at all. So, you know, I can see if, if, if I choose to keep people on the payroll through a downturn, I know exactly what, what that's costing. I mean, if I got rid of that group of people, how do I say What I don't see is what is the loyalty and commitment that I bought by, by, by not doing so? That doesn't show up on, on, a, on, a, on, a, on, a, on a, on a P and L anywhere. And yet I will tell you it pays huge dividends. And all of these CEOs will tell you it pays huge dividends. Uh, and so, you know, uh, like, likewise, you know, most of the costs of that old bureaucratic model, the, the apathy, uh, all of that, that uh, destructive politicking that goes on, the timidity, uh, uh, the, the insularity that you find in, in most organizations, that doesn't show up on a P&L at all. And so, in fact, we, we built this little instrument called the Bureaucratic Mass Index, BMI. It's free. You can find a link in the book. Uh, but you can go and start to say, well, gee, how bureaucratic is our organization anyway? Because, you know, in general, we don't worry about things we don't measure. And so That's just right. like a decade ago, very few companies measured uh, their environmental impact. Now, most, right? They, they know right. what their carbon footprint is. They're working to reduce it. And I think it's the same when you look at these negative effects of our, of our, of our, of our, of our you know, multi-layered, rule-choked organizations. We've just assumed, okay, that's the price of doing business. You can't do anything about it. No, no, you can do something about it, but you gotta, you gotta start to measure that to, 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 uh, to know. 
So, Gary, what are you doing these days? Uh, you're not doing keynote speeches around the world. I know that. So how are you staying connected and, um, st you know, staying motivated and, and in engaged with everything that's going on out there? Well, you know, I for my first priority is family and friends. So I I make sure that, that like we have weekly calls with families where someone will just go get, get a drink and we sit down and we have time just, you know, just to be friends and family together. I think that's that's you know really important in a challenging time. But you know, the reality is today you can have presence uh, just about anywhere and you can do things together. I mean, I'm being I'm I've been generally surprised. Peter, at how, you know, on, on some of these uh, things I've done, we have hundreds, sometimes even thousands of people together. You can break them into small groups. You can get conversations going. We're using some of the, the some of the new tools like Palette and others where you can do shared brainstorming. So, you know, the, the great thing about human beings, our organizations aren't always very resilient, but we're resilient as hell. And, and when we have a new challenge, we will figure it out how to go around through over and whatever, and, and we'll do that. And so that, you know, in a way has been very heartening, um, hard not to see the people you love, you know, hard not to just have that sense of togetherness. But amazingly, I think, you know, we're learning, we can still do a hell of a lot together, we can make progress, we can change things. And, and certainly my approach, the, the, the approach I take when we're working with large organizations, we're using technology platforms to do that anyway. You know, we're, right. we're, we're in a big tech company, everybody would know them. We have 70,000 people together on a platform we built that allows them to innovate together, right? So the technology, uh, you know, it's always a double-edged sword, but my gosh, it does give us the chance to collaborate at low cost, to do things together and, and, and uh, you know, has, has uh, been, I mean, uh, imagine trying to go through this maybe 20 or 30 years ago, that would have been You're right. a dozen times worse. I mean, even, even 10 years ago. You know, exactly. it's, uh, you know, the, the technology now with video is such that it actually works. It's no longer surveillance camera looking stuff, right? You, you can have a really have nice conversation. It's, it's still very scary. It's still very scary, Peter, when a message comes up that says, uh, Google, Google would like access to your camera. <laughs> yeah, I know. <laughs> that, that still makes me swallow hard uh, yeah. before I do it. You know, but even even here, there's kind of an interesting object lesson in in all of this. You know, obviously we're all you know we're all on Zoom now, and Zoom. Uh, I don't know what their market value is. I think it's over a hundred billion dollars. I'm like ginormous number. Somebody somebody will correct me. I'm sure. But it's interesting. The guy who founded uh, Zoom uh, was working for Webex, uh, what, which had been acquired some years ago by Cisco. Right. And and the guy was so keen. To, he, he knew WebEx was not very well suited for the cloud and not very well suited for mobile device. He was like so keen to, to build something that exploited these new trends. And, and he couldn't get anybody at Cisco to say yes, right? Fighting up through all the levels and trying to get the budget approvals. And the guy left and built Zoom. And so, you know, <laughs> yeah. I mean, yeah, exactly. thank, thank goodness we live in a world where, you know, it does, you know, today companies do get punished when they don't move fast enough. And uh, somebody will come along and do something better. So that's you know, that's that's a great thing. And and for sure, COVID has been an immense spur to innovation of all sorts, not only in healthcare but in how we communicate and how we run projects. So uh, yeah, if 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 we can make our organizations as resilient as the people inside of them, that that that's that's a huge win. Absolutely. Well, Gary, thank you so much for taking time to speak with me today here on Total Picture. It's uh, it's really been a pleasure to reconnect with you. And again, uh, I really enjoyed your book, your new book, uh, Humanocracy, Creating Organizations as Amazing as the People Inside Them. Uh, I totally recommend uh, this book. And um, I look forward to seeing you sometime in the future at another Unleash event or a, another event somewhere in the world. I hope so too, Peter. Thank you so much for talking to me. Please hang on for just a minute. Like most of you, my business was completely upended by COVID-19. Instead of filming marketing, sales, testimonial, and product demo videos at conferences and corporate offices, I'm living on Zoom. Zoom can be an effective video tool for many kinds of powerful content. As people have become more comfortable being on camera and upgrading their video streaming capabilities, 
we are now able to create high-quality, entertaining, and informative videos using the Zoom platform. Virtual meetings, customer testimonials, product demos, marketing pitches. You'll be amazed at the video quality and the amount of sophistication and graphic complexity we're able to create. For a free consultation on how you can use video to market and promote your business, send me an email, peter at totalpicture.com, and check out totalpicture.com forward slash work. I look forward to hearing from you, and thanks for tuning in.